Um, I'm just going to leave it to you um, to kind of work your way through that list of topics. Um, the internet's not amazing, so I'm not going to interrupt you or anything. I'm just going to let you talk, if that's okay. Okay, now I, I don't have the list in front of me, but um, I think I'm pretty familiar with what it is that you're looking to do. So if you want to just stop me at some stage, please say. Uh, the, uh, have the guys done any mock, they've done one mock trial so far? Nothing. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, well, um, the starting point is for the uh, council to introduce themselves. So that's a matter of court etiquette. Mm -hmm. So the starting point then is for the first barrister. So who, what's the name of your first barrister, Jackie? Um, uh, Lily. Okay, well, Lily would introduce herself by surname. What's her surname? Uh, Berent. Uh, Berent, okay. So, uh, uh, she would say, may it please the court, my name is Berents, and I appear with my learned friend, name of uh, second counsel for the plaintiff or defendant. So the plaintiff obviously goes first and announces her appearance. The defend, after she's announced appearance for herself and her co-barrister, the other side, the defence, will announce their appearance as well. So if you were... Um, but if the, the plaintiff, obviously, you go first. The judge will say, may I have appearances, please? If the, uh, you go uh, second, you wait till the plaintiff has announced their appearance and then they, uh, you, you announce yours. Let me assume for the moment that uh, you're the plaintiff. That's probably the easiest thing to do. Uh, the uh, first job of the first barrister is to open their case. An opening is basically like an advertisement for the case that is to come. And so it's uh, a persuasive story uh, where the main points of the case are articulated by the first uh, uh, barrister. So the barrister will say, uh, I think the, I'm trying to think what the second case is. The second case I think is, uh, um, I think it's an, uh, a workplace bullying case. But let, let's just keep it simple, we'll call it a, a negligence case for the moment. Um, so the uh, first barrister would give the, just the basic story. On the 17th of August 2020, uh, my client uh, was at work uh, when the following incidents occurred. Um, uh, thinking uh, the first case that we uh, I've got the first case. The first case we did. Just so interrupt you. Sorry, um, I've got my legal studies class here and I'm actually going to record you so I can show it to the mock trial team as well because they're different groups. Oh, okay. So you don't have being recorded, I hope? No, not at all. It's just I'm mindful of the fact that if I'm not getting feedback, I might sense it's being a bit of a monotone. So if anyone wants to interrupt me, feel free to do it. Okay, so the, um, uh, the opening address basically uh, tells the court what you're going to tell the court. So... It's generally reckoned that advertising works if people believe that it's true and it's relevant to what uh, the um, potential customer is looking to uh, purchase. And the same applies to the judge or magistrate. So when you give your opening address, uh, there are a number of tricks, such as you might say, look, Your Honour, we will persuade you uh, that the plaintiff uh, was at work on the 26th of August 2018 for the sake of argument. And we will tell you that when she was at work, uh, the following events happened. So uh, do's for the opening address are tell the court who the witnesses will be, tell the court what the witnesses will say, uh, tell the court the story uh, in sequence. I, I find as a, it's not a bad idea to have a simple chronology at your fingertips, just identifying the key events. Most of these events take place over the course of a single day. A number of these problems were written by Sean McCaleb, so they have a certain humour about them, but not all of them were. Um, so now I apologise that Louis sort of making a bit of a noise in the background there, but we said we'd try and do our best with that. Uh, so the um, uh, uh, chronology just sets out the main facts, the material facts to try and tell the court. You know, we'll try and persuade uh, Your Honour that. <laughs> With your opening address, 
uh, it's good to remember uh, that it's a simple message. So I, have, I often say that the opening address should enable you to encapsulate your case in the same way that you would explain it to your butcher. So if your butcher said to you, uh, um, uh, um, is it Lily Barrett's? Is that, um, um, anyway, to say to your first barrister, what case have you got on today? She would say, I've got a case where someone drove their car into the back of someone else. Uh, that's the sort of uh, simple headline space you want to have in your own head when you open your case. Now, they're the do's for the opening address. The don'ts for the opening address are you normally don't argue the law. Some people are tempted to say, I'd like to refer your honour, your honour to the case of you know, um, Smith versus Hughes or something like that. That doesn't have any place in the opening address because you haven't, the court hasn't heard your evidence. Uh, it hasn't made any of the factual findings that are necessary to inform an argument on the law. The legal argument comes at the end of the case and I'll get to that in due course. Okay, then the opening counsel then calls their first witness in chief uh, and leads evidence from the, the witness. In evidence in chief, the evidence is given by the witness themselves. And so it's important to avoid the trap of basically feeding the information to the, the witness. And that's why one of the objections is no leading of evidence. Some simple tricks with evidence in chief are to ask what, why, when, how questions. What, why, when, how questions uh, produce open answers. Um, uh, what happened, uh, I've got to be careful about that. Do you remember the 8th of August, 2018? Um, what happened on that day? What happened next? Who was there? How did they uh, do this? That, what, if in doubt, what, why, when, how questions make evidence in chief uh, the evidence of the witness? Uh, you can imagine just how unsatisfactory it would be if the questioner said, well, on the 17th of August, 2018, you were at the car park, weren't you? Yes. That, that means that the witness is not giving a, given a chance to shine. And so the power that the evidence might have if the witness was giving the evidence in themselves is lost. In uh, leading evidence in chief, you're mindful of the five objections we're allowed to take in this competition. Those objections are leading, obviously, hearsay, opinion, character, and... Uh, relevance. Most objections, most successful objections are taken briefly. The opposing counsel will say, uh, Your Honour, I object, relevance. And then the judge will look to you and say, well, how do you justify the relevance of that question? So that's the sort of thing that you uh, need to face. And of course, when you're preparing for cross exam, uh, preparing to meet the case of the other side, one of the things you were doing is looking at what likely objections can be taken from the uh, witness statements. Some of the witness statements uh, have built in problems. So, you know, you're asked to lead hearsay or you're asked to lead irrelevant uh, answers. That's just a competition. And it, it tests two things. If you can get away with it, uh, then you look better than the other side because you get your evidence in. If you're the other side and you successfully close the evidence down, you show to the judge that you know what you're doing. The um, other objection that we take is uh, Brown versus Dunn. Um, let me just explain Brown versus Dunn uh, for a moment. You need to know what your case is so that when you're cross-examining the other side, you put your case consistently across both counsel because there can be subtle variations between the witness statements, but ultimately it's the same case. And you need to put to the, your, your case to the other side to give them a chance to explain it. The judges are told to look out for failure to comply with Brown versus Dunn. So if, for example, your witness in defence will ultimately say, the plaintiff admitted to me that they shouldn't have been there, you have to ask that question to the plaintiff. You have to say to the plaintiff, well, plaintiff, you had a conversation with my client on the 16th of August, 2018, and you said it was all my fault, didn't you? Now, the plaintiff obviously will deny that or do whatever they need to do, but from the judge's perspective, You've discharged your fairness onus of giving the other side a chance to explain what to, to give their side of the story. Okay, so that's the uh, evidence in chief. What, why, when, how questions, ideally. Uh, get the whole story out if uh, obviously that's part of the competition rules. Uh, then 
uh, probably it's natural to go to the cross-examination of the first witness. So just like the rules for evidence in chief are open questions, um, letting the witness give the answers, the rules are exactly the opposite for cross-examination. In cross-examination, the last thing you want to do is give the witness a chance to um, um, give you an answer that's helpful to their case. So you don't, for example, say uh, something like, uh, well, um, uh, uh, what do you think of the plaintiff's case, um, uh, uh, of the defendant's case, uh, to give the witness a chance to say, well, counsel, I'm glad you asked me that question. I think the plaintiff's case is a real dog and I've got no idea why they're bringing this unmeritorious claim against me. So don't ask open. Uh, I, I say to my own instructing solicitors, if I ask a question in cross-examination that starts with the words, what, why, when, or how, <laughs> you throw yourself across the back of the courtroom and club me to death at the bar table. It's their bad. You, some, in a masterclass, there is a place for open questions in cross-examination, but it doesn't arise in this competition. Questions in cross-examination, uh, uh, firstly, um, uh, are informed by your case theory. Uh, so when the judge is listening to the cross-examination, the judge is a little bit anxious to work out where, where you're coming from. So in a perfect world, the uh, um, judge can work out pretty early what your, your, your case theory is. Your case theory basically is why you're going to win. But in terms of the technique of questions in cross-examination, they, they are closed questions. Ideally, they don't give the witness any opportunity other than to answer yes or no. What, um, um, uh, and so they're often asked, uh, well, uh, um, you agree uh, that you were there on the 18th of August, 2018, don't you? That's a yes or no question, ideally. Uh, sometimes the questions can be put as propositions. Uh, uh, you were there on the 18th of August. Uh, you ran over my client's cat. Uh, uh, you were standing with uh, a, a mobile phone in your hand, not watching the road. That, that's the sort of uh, questions that you, uh, uh, the style of questions you put. So when I was talking about evidence in chief, I was explaining that the idea of evidence in chief is to get the witness to give the evidence rather than have the question to give the evidence. But it's often said that in cross-examination, the exact opposite applies. That is to say, the evidence comes out of the questions rather than out of the answers, because when you're asking questions, the judge is hearing what your case is really all about. So um, that's why the questions tend to be um, uh, to contain the evidence and really shouldn't give the witness anywhere to go apart from answering yes or no. So that's technique for cross-examination. There are, um, there's one uh, important difference between evidence in chief and evidence in cross-examination uh, and that is obviously the questions in uh, cross-examination are leading questions. So just like in evidence in chief, you're not allowed to ask leading questions. In cross-examination, in a lot of ways, you're only allowed to ask leading questions uh, because the question itself becomes the evidence you're looking to get before the court. Now, um, a couple of things about case summary and case theory. If, if I can just give you these concepts, these are, um, uh, slightly different, but I'd like to see if I can explain the difference between the two of you, between the two of them. The case summary is how you explain the case to your butcher. I'm, I'm doing a case on Monday about uh, someone who uh, ran their car at the back of my client's car, my client had a whiplash injury. The butcher understands what that case is about. The case theory is a bit more subtle and requires a bit more work between the uh, barristers and the solicitors to work out uh, how best to identify the case theory. The case theory is why you're going to win, and it informs all your questions in cross-examination. You can't do much about evidence in chief, that's just written in the, in the, in the problem. But in cross-examination, your case theory informs how you ask the questions. So in the simple, uh, sim um, simple example of a car running into the back of you, that's probably the case theory is obvious, and that is that um, uh, uh, they should have seen your, you can't run to the back of someone. Um, uh, each case had its own case theory and in a sense it doesn't so much matter whether your case theory is right or wrong or it will tend to win or lose your case admittedly but it's important that it's consistent across the council so if they, you sit around and workshop the issue well why should we win this case um, 
that answer will come out and then that should work out, should inform how you ask questions in cross-examination. So in my case, uh, for example, I'm in a barrister's chambers and if I have a case or a knotty case, I'm trying to work out um, how to win, I'll go and sit down with another barrister and we'll just work out why it is that it should be a winning case. So, um, uh, so case theory is to that extent slightly different from case uh, summary. Um, sometimes your case theory will be uh, no more than the defendant admitted that he did it. And that can be a great case theory because it's a bit hard to work uh, your, your way around it. Uh, in an identification case, your case theory might be it was cold and dark and the witness was 60 feet away. They couldn't have positively identified the uh, client. So your case summary in an identification case might be, um, I'm doing a case where the defendant hit my client. The case theory, why you should win, is the witness was 60 feet away and could not have made out who the witness was. So they're, they're slightly subtle differences. The case theory is a lot of fun to, to get to because uh, that's really where the students work out, you know, they're smart. I, I should say in 91, I, I was coaching a, a, a team to, uh, and they went all the way to the grand final from Farrafield Gardens. And when they did the case, they actually lost the case at uh, the grand final. And I was horrified that what had happened was their case theory had actually slightly varied from the first barrister to the second barrister. And afterwards, I, I mustn't have been there when they worked, it, worked out the case theory. I said, well, why, why, why'd you do that? And then they said, well, there's a slight difference between the two witness statements. So we figured each one had to have a slightly different case theory. So that, that's a mistake I carry baggage with even now. Um, and it just is why I'm explaining each, the team should have the same case theory because when they ask their questions, their questions are um, informed by the case theory. Okay, so that then gets to the opening address for the defendant. The opening address for the defendant is very similar to the opening address for the plaintiff, except that, of course, by the time the defendant gives their opening address, the uh, court's already heard all the plaintiff's witnesses. So, um, uh, sometimes a, a defendant's opening address will say, well, Your Honour's heard the cross-examination of the, our cross-examination of the plaintiff, and you'd understand from that that our case uh, is that um, the plaintiff has simply failed to identify my client, or something along those lines. But as with the plaintiff's opening address, it's still a story, so you have to say what your case is. Uh, as with the plaintiff's opening address, you have to say who the witnesses are and what they'll say. Your Honour will be calling two witnesses, our first witness, will say that he was standing on the corner and he observed the plaintiff's witness uh, smoking a cigarette, talking his mobile phone and not looking in the direction of the, I mean, that's the sort of thing you might uh, say. And then second witness will say uh, A, B, C, D. So the defendant's opening address is similar to the plaintiff's opening address with the exception that the defendant knows that the court has already heard the plaintiff's case. The defendant's opening address might need to be a little bit more flexible than the plaintiff's opening case. Because by the time the plaintiff, uh, the defendant opens, um, you've heard some evidence. And so the case may have changed subtly from the time you started writing your opening address. I might say that's a bit of a masterclass. That almost never happens. So as a matter of practicality, uh, it's safe to write your opening address as a defendant, uh, but just be mindful that sometimes something slight, some slight difference might take place. Then the defendant, uh, uh, leads evidence in chief, exactly the same as the plaintiff, open questions, what, why, when, how, um, is prepared for objections. The most difficult objection, uh, in my view, is hearsay. If you understand the hearsay rule, you understand law pretty damn well. Uh, hearsay is um, um, an attempt to lead evidence of what someone who is not a witness said to you uh, to try and, prove the, try and prove the truth of what it was that witness was saying. So. You might say, well, Mrs. Smith told me uh, that she'd seen Mr. Jones uh, hit the plaintiff. That's hearsay. Um, if uh, the witness turns up and said, I saw Mr. Jones hit the plaintiff, that's direct evidence, that's fine. Uh, but if a witness turns up to say, well, I heard someone else say that they had seen Mr. Jones hit the plaintiff, that's hearsay. Hearsay objections are uh, difficult to answer, uh, but there's a trick uh, which most judges are satisfied to accept provided that it's appropriate. And that is sometimes the evidence is led not to prove the truth of it, but merely to prove the truth of what was said, uh, merely to prove that it was said. So um, uh, uh, an example uh, might be um, 
In fact, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but as a simple objection, uh, a simple answer to the objection, um, the witness, the, the barrister can say, we accept that it's hearsay. Uh, we're not trying to lead it to prove the truth of what was said, but it is relevant for the court to hear that it was said uh, that applies in some circumstances. While I'm on that, um, uh, that's the objection to hearsay. If you, uh, hearsay objections come, uh, there are plenty of hearsay objections in the problems normally, uh, but uh, in my experience, they're rarely picked up in the mock trials. The next objection, uh, the objection that's most commonly taken and most successfully taken is the objection relevance, object relevance. Um, some of the uh, evidence you are asked to lead is frankly completely irrelevant. It's just unrelated to the case. Um, you've got two choices. You can either say it's a fair cop, I accept the, um, uh, accept the objection. Uh, uh, but uh, a good trick is to say it's relevant to the narrative. We just um, ask your honour to hear it for the narrative. It's part of the story. It's not directly, it may not be directly relevant to a specific material fact, but it, it informs what was happening at the time the, um, uh, at the time of the events. Uh, Brown versus Dunn, for just a quick repeat on that, uh, because uh, by this stage, the defendant is attempting to give evidence. And if it hasn't given the plaintiff a chance to um, to explain that. So the defendant's now saying for the first time, for example, that they heard the plaintiff admit that they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's now open to the plaintiff to say, well, I object, Your Honour, Brown versus Dunn. Uh, that uh, proposition wasn't put to my witness. My witness hasn't been given a chance to explain it. How can this witness now try and give evidence uh, which is inconsistent or which has not been put to my client? That's a masterclass objection. It's in the rules. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think I've heard that objection taken in the last three or four years. Uh, so, but nonetheless, it is uh, an important objection that you can take. Uh, then uh, finally, um, uh, finally, uh, uh, you've got the closing addresses. Now the closing addresses, unlike the opening addresses, are where you draw the threads together. So here's your chance now to, uh, to argue the law. Uh, so for example, you might say, well, your honor's now heard the following uh, facts, um, and we'd like to take your honour to the law that's relevant to those facts. So, as a as a starting point um, in a closing address, uh, a good a, a good idea I find is to write down the material facts you think you've proven or that you want the court to find. Uh, the material facts are the the main facts of the case. The plaintiff was um, at a place. The plaintiff was struck by the defendant, the plaintiff was injured, for example, they're, they're sort of basic material uh, facts. There's lots of other facts that inform those, the little facts from which an inference might be drawn, but the big facts, the, the facts that decide the case are all the material facts. Applying the law to the material facts uh, then is important for two reasons. Firstly, the cases you've been asked to cite might be absolutely on all fours with the evidence that's before the court. So you can say you're on a, you're on a we have no doubt uh, that um, uh, this case is uh, uh, exactly the same as was decided by the South Australian Supreme Court in 2014 in the case of, you know, for the sake of argument, WRB and Bird's Eye. Uh, and we ask you to have regards to the remarks of the following, that, you know, the remarks from the judgment as follows. Um, and the material facts are also important if you want to distinguish a case, because you might say, well, you want to, in this particular case, um, my friend has attempted to say that uh, we should be bound by the decision of the, the House of Lords in, um, uh, for the sake of argument, Ruxley and Jones. Um, uh, but, Your Honour, we distinguished the, uh, this case from that on the facts. In that particular case, this happened. In our case, something completely different happened. In terms of citing the authorities, um, that's another matter of formality. Um, Mostly, uh, barristers simply cite them by the initials that you're given in the case. So like 2014 SASC 42, uh, but it is slightly more elegant to cite the cases by their actual descriptions. So for example, 1942 2AC 63 would probably be described as the House of Lords uh, in Smith versus Jones decided in 1942 and reported in volume two, appeal cases at 642. That's a style thing. Uh, the, if you're in doubt about how the 
cases are correctly cited, I think that's something you can Google. Uh, but the cases we give you, I think, are AC, which are appeal cases, uh, QB, Queen's Bench, SASC, South Australian Supreme Court, NSWLR, New South Wales Law Report. So there's a relatively small number of them, but you do look slightly more polished if you cite the cases by their correct description. So running through then from uh, top to bottom, uh, our opening address, sorry, opening uh, introduction of counsel. May it please the court. My name is Smith. I appear with my learned friend Jones for the plaintiff. The judge will say, Thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, then the defendant will get up. May it please the court. My name is Hobbs and I appear with my learned friend uh, Murphy uh, for the defendant. The judge will say, Thank you, Mr. Hobbs. Uh, the first barrister then uh, opens their case, tells the story, identifies the witnesses, tell the court, tells the court what the witnesses will say. Uh, tells the court the case that they'll try and prove. Your Honour will prove that my client was injured as a result of being run over by the defendant for the sake of argument. The, uh, then repeating, the first barrister then immediately takes their witness through their evidence, starting from the top. Um, uh, they ask what their name is and then they say, can I take you to the 28th of August 2018? Do you remember that day? Yes, what happened? And then, well, what, what went here? Quit, went where questions? being ready for objections from the defendants, the defendants' objections being hearsay, opinion, character, and done. Be ready to answer those objections. You get marked for how well you deal with them. First barrister, the defendant then cross-examines, closed questions as opposed to open questions, questions that tell the court what the case theory is all about. You didn't see my client at all, did you? That's the sort of uh, question that, and the judge immediately feels relaxed because they know where the case is going. Um, uh, then uh, the uh, second barrister for the plaintiff does exactly the same thing, faces exactly the same issues. Uh, then the uh, first barrister says, may I please the court, that's the case for the plaintiff. So that's you done. The defendant then gets up, does exactly the same thing, opens their case with the subtle variation that the court's already heard the evidence, takes the witness through their um, evidence, uh, faces objections, leading, ESA, character, relevance, opinion, and possibly Brown versus Dunn if you want to put a problem to you. Um, that takes you to the case, closing addresses, uh, identify your material facts, uh, apply the law to them, and tell the court your case theory, why you're going to win. Your Honour, we're going to win because they didn't see my client, or whatever the argument might be. All right, Jackie, so that's the, that, the double run through. Any questions that come out of that? No, that's a brilliant start. Thank you so much. Um, right. I'll be again about coming um for another training i think we have three hours up to three hours with you is that oh, yeah yeah, yeah. Now this well this seemed to work this morning i i um uh it's possible to get out there afternoons are slightly better for me but um having said that uh play it by ear so uh yes delighted to and and also if you've got any questions if there's something that um uh you just can't quite get your head around give me a call because um sometimes the answers are not that involved and it's easy just to ask a quick question what's uppermost in your mind rather than um, uh, let it stew. All right. Um, the other thing is, I think you answered this, but with the first round for the, the team competition, um, the opposing side didn't get their witness statement into the courtroom, which then made it difficult for our side's cross-examination. Um, so then would you do that thing where you say, I put it to you that blah, 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 and give them a chance to address it. Um, it... Uh, I don't know the answer to that question because I've never, uh, I haven't run into that one before, but I think the, um, if you know what your case theory is, you probably can do that quite safely by, by uh, you know that the judge knows what the witness evidence is. So <clears throat> if you, um, uh, uh, cross-examine as if the evidence had been led, as you suggest, that's probably a good thing to do. You're not likely to run into that again, Jackie. That's, I, I've been doing this for 30 odd years. I've never, I haven't heard of that before. So that doesn't sound like it's a common problem. Um, but I, I, bearing in mind, it's a, it's, it's a competition as well as a, a trial. And so unlike a trial, which is anything can happen, um, there's only a restricted number of things that can happen and you are judged by how you deal with the stuff that's in the book, how you deal with leading your evidence in an open way, how you deal with objections, uh, both making, making and taking them, and how you deal with your closing argument. So 
uh, I think the answer is yes, long winded way of saying yes to exactly what you suggested, and that is just pretend that they've done the right thing and then you do the right thing and do it effectively, and that's how you'll get, get through it. Yes, I think you're right. It's probably not going to happen again. It was just um, tricky on the first round. Yeah. Yes. There you go. Well, All right. Okay. Thank you so much. That was absolutely right. brilliant. And I'll be in touch about some um, more times. Okay. Thanks, Jackie. Now, I don't know how to exit this window. I'll so, just, if you know how to. I'll just end it. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye.